ahead and get started as people start to log on so we can really get to the meat of what we're doing today. Um, so welcome to our first Drive Electric Dialogue series focused on our proposed e-bus make ready pilot infrastructure program. A few housekeeping items today. Uh, please send any questions or comments to Lisa Gyeong, um, who's our senior program manager for electrification of transportation. And she's also our host, um, kind of running everything in the background today. So you'll be able to reach her in the chat box and she'll share them kind of during the second half of today's session during the Q&A. Anything we don't get to immediately today, we'll collect and respond and collectively to the group. We're also recording this. Our preference is that folks show their faces because we wanna make it feel as in-person as possible given the circumstances, but we also wanna you know, respect your privacy. So if you don't feel comfortable being recorded in this situation, we understand, and I just ask that you turn off your video function, which you can find in the bottom left-hand corner of um, WebEx. So to give you a sense of today's format, which you'll also see in the chat box, the first 30 to 40 minutes, we'll focus on three speakers, myself, John Nouchi, and Michael Colon, and then we'll jump into some more interactive pieces and Q&A um, where we really, really want to hear for you, from you. Great to see so many faces. I think everyone's, all their faces are coming up. Um, so we have some city council members, some elected officials, uh, and then folks from the commission as well. So thank you all for making time to join this call. It's, it's also good to see some of the, the new faces. So before we begin, I'd love to kind of get a sense from the electric vehicle perspective, who's on the call. So, we're going to use menti.com to drive a little bit of interaction. If you can log on to menti.com and use the password 768781, which you'll also see in the chat box, you'll be able to answer the first question and Lisa will will share her screen so we can we can see what the answers all are. Okay. Things are kind of moving around. Loving the big thinking with rail and e-bike. Although Tesla seems to be taking the cake right now. Cool. We'll have we'll have another one of these later later on. But thank you so much for for sharing. I recently read that there's now five different varieties of electric vehicles, so it's really exciting to see so much variation coming onto market. Um, given the question uh, that we shared in Menti, I'm actually a recent EV owner, so I just bought a 2018 Nissan Leaf and I'm testing it out, getting to know it. Uh, it was interesting to go to the dealership because there's always this kind of misconception that EVs are really expensive, but in the uh, lightly used market, um, the 2016, there was a whole parking lot full of 2016s that were on, all under $10,000. So it was interesting to see kind of the evolution of the electric vehicle uh, market. But more importantly than owning an EV, um, I'm actually an avid bus rider as well. And that's near and dear to my heart. If any of you guys are familiar with the Honolulu bus system, my line is the number three. So uh, shout out to anyone else who, who rides on the number three line. I recently joined Hawaiian Electric because I 100% believe in this opportunity. A clean transportation system that fully leverages all of the renewable energy we're adding to the grid. So in Hawaii, sunshine is our best asset, as we know, and I can't wait to see our fleet of rainbow buses also run on sunshine. I come from an urban planning background and a transportation background, and I recognize that the words dispatchable power supply don't really mean much to transportation people. And in the same way that the word deadheading doesn't really mean much to energy people. So I think what electric transportation really allows us to do is think more expansively about both of our industries, which is really exciting. 
So what we're hoping to accomplish today. Uh, first, we want to share our perspectives on why e bus electrification is important and also learn from you. Um, today, and in the coming weeks and months, what would be most helpful to make you successful? This isn't as many of, you know, fully unchartered territory. There's a number of utilities and entities across the country that are already offering uh, make readies and we've talked to many of them. But I would like to say that I think we're leaders in the space and that we can fully evaluate the opportunity for electric vehicles and vehicle electrification in a high renewable situation that others um, haven't had the opportunity yet. So this builds off of an entire, you know, multi-year effort of work that predates me. And I can really give kudos to my team, Michael, Jimmy, Lisa, Kevin, Greg, um, Tandy. So they put together the electrification of transportation roadmap, which was published back in 2018. And in that roadmap, it actually looked at and examined how adding vehicle load during high renewable energy times could help reduce rates for everyone, regardless of whether or not they owned an EV, um, by increasing kilowatt hours that include the fixed costs. This also builds off of the e-bus tariff that we offered last year for the first time. So I want to zoom out just a little bit for a second. So thank you for humoring me. <laughs> I've been thinking a lot about the importance of transit, given that we've been in isolation for the last few months, um, especially in the wake of the pandemic. This is a time when our bus drivers have been on the front lines transporting essential workers. And we're really fortunate to have John Nouchi here to dive into this a little bit deeper. Um, and with respect to the more recent events, highlighting the prominence of systemic racism, power and privilege. I've also been thinking a lot about how transportation has and continues to play an important role in these disparities, both in Hawaii and the continent, and is actually complicit in the system. And I'd be remiss not to highlight this. And I don't, I don't mention this to beat ourselves up, but for example, transportation is a, the family's second highest household expense after housing. It's the highest cause of fatalities for people under the age of 40. Highways have cut through entire communities by design, by intent. And as we all know, it's also by and large our biggest polluter right now. And so again, I don't say this to beat ourselves up, but rather to highlight that we have an immense opportunity as we enter into this new era of mobility to design something together that's better and create a system that's clean and quiet, connected, reliable and affordable. And that's really kind of the underlying effort of what we're trying to do here. From the perspective of Hawaiian Electric, we have the potential to support everyone's efforts in this, which is really exciting. Not only from building out infrastructure to achieve our goals, but also to create systems that can lower rates. So it feels like an opportunity for kind of a triple win. Um, and this is new territory for us in the same way that I think it's new territory for everyone. Um, and we will plan as much as we can pilot, uh, which is what we're proposing today. And we'll hopefully have a lot of successes. We may make mistakes, but we can commit that we're um, really committed to learning and to iterating and to improving our processes to advance everyone's goals. So with that, I'd like to introduce John Nouchi, Deputy Director of Department of Transportation Services. I asked him to share a little bit about the e-bus program that DTS has to offer. And this is really coming from the public sector perspective, but I, I would like to say that the private sector bus operators are equally as important for us. And um, I'm also hoping that John can share a little bit about why transit is so important for our communities, especially in light of this recent pan pandemic. And I promise that we'll get into disaggregated power supply really, really soon, but I never want to lose sight of the fact that in moving electrons, our main goal is really to serve our community and our customers. So with that, I am really thrilled to hand this over to John Nucci. 
Hello, Aki. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to borrow a phrase from an old Cecilio and Capono song that I like. It's so nice to see familiar faces out in the crowd. Um, I love that the fact that we're talking about electrification of transportation. And yet when I look at this grid of people in front of me, it's just it's there, there's hardly any face out here that I'm not familiar with or I haven't heard of. So that's great. That means that we are all proceeding on this together. And that's something that I'm going to talk about as I go through um, my presentation here. So let me go ahead and share my screen. So I will be talking today about how the pandemic, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected transportation, the whole industry in general, but it also will speak to why electrification of transportation is, is probably now more important than everything, than, 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 than everything else for us in the transit industry. So first of all, for me, um, just wanted to introduce myself. I'm John Nochi. Yes, currently serve um, in Mayor Kirk Caldwell's cabinet as a deputy director of the Department of Transportation Services. Um, I previously also worked at the Honolulu Authority for Rapid Transportation (HART) and also worked at Oahu Transit Services and the bus um, for for quite a while. And that speaks to the fact that I am a hundred percent transit geek. I love transit. When I go on vacation, I ride transit for fun, which probably baffles the mind for a lot of other people, but it is what I do and it is what I love. And especially now, as we look at some of the, the challenges that we have right now, you know, we're, we realize now in this COVID-19 pandemic time that transportation is super essential, um, that our transit workers are essential. And we had to really think about how do we make sure that we protect them? How do we make sure that they have every protection that they need when they're out there on the front lines and exposed to, to anything out there, especially the COVID-19. And basically, how do we make their jobs better? But how, also, how do we plan better mobility for our current riders and for our future riders? Um, that's been very difficult for us to confront because a lot of people will poo-poo transit workers and say that, you know, they're not frontline workers like police, fire, and emergency, nor are they medical workers. But I think without essential public transit, our economy, which is already kind of ground to a halt, will further suffer huge consequences if essential workers can't even be moved around by our essential workers. So to that end, we really um, upped our game in terms of cleaning the whole interiors of our buses. We uh, we did that early on in February, anticipating COVID-19 coming on in, as a part of our daily lives. But we've also um, encountered daily electrostatic cleaning of our whole vehicle's interiors, and we're looking at better ways that we can do that. We're investing in protective driver barriers for our bus operators. And I think most of all, most transformatively, we've required masks both for our bus operators and our passengers. But really going along with that, you know, we, we, there was a nationwide campaign called Sound the Horn. And that was when transit agencies across the nation really wanted to link arms. And I don't know if you guys remember those 80s um, type things like Hands Across America, but we wanted to do something in the transit industry that was like honks across America to honor essential transit workers, including those who have perished, you know, in their duties to provide mobility. Now, New York City Transit did see a lot of um, transit operators pass due to COVID-19. And I can gladly say that I do not believe any transit workers in Hawaii have died because of COVID-19. But with this Sound the Horn campaign, which was hashtag Heroes Moving Heroes, it was a way for us to pay tribute to the essential workers who serve us and that, you know, I, I think it was really kind of poignant for me that Google, if you look here on the bottom, Google did a Google Doodle to dedicate um, praise to transit workers nationwide or worldwide. And I'm going to play a little video for you that we put together in, in, our, in our statewide transit group. Um, I just want to let you know, there's going to be a lot of honking. So if you have your volume turned up, you may want to dim your volume just a little bit or just be aware there's a lot of sometimes obnoxious sounding honking in the video that's going to follow. So hopefully this plays okay. Oh, 
And one of the things I did want to point out too is we did get rail in here as part of our transit portrait in Honolulu. So for all of those who are going to naysay rail and say, you know, we should stop building it, we should tear it down. It's 75% constructed and we have trains running out on the guideway. So I do want to shout out to Aki because we both crossed paths there um, at heart and we worked together for, for quite a while at heart. And I think the, the, the video of trains running on the guideway is very like visceral and very, a, a very pride inducing thing for us. But, you know, for this sound of horn, um, we wanted to involve everybody in the state and you can see some of our partners in that video that would coincide with the nation's honking for to honor transit workers. So we did it at 9 a.m. while in the East Coast, they did it at 3 p.m. But really, that is a kind of a, 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 a micro view of something very macro. So I want to talk about the, this concept of kako apo, all of us together. So in 2017, the four county mayors really pledged together on the deck of Hokulea in Poka'i Bay to remove fossil fuels from the public transportation equation and commit to 100% fleet fueled by renewable energy by 2035. Now that is a huge task to take upon. And I, I think Hiko um, I heard that and has, has answered the call on that for us with the e-bus tariff that they have worked through with, with the PUC and everyone. And I think that's been really a huge piece of us committing to move forward with this. But this idea that we're all gonna do this together, again, like to see all the, the familiar faces in, in the grid on this WebEx is great because we're all familiar with each other. We all know how each of us can contribute, whether it be advocacy, whether it can be actual design work, how to design better infrastructure how to plan better infrastructure. I think there's a lot of different people on here. We're all bringing their skill sets to the table to all make this happen together. And I really wanted to kind of commemorate our statewide transit ohana. So these are the four county transit providers with um, from e everywhere from Kauai to Oahu to Maui to Hawaii County. And this ohana and led by our, our state transportation office too, this ohana has really been key and us kind of facing into the future that we're looking at with electrification and saying, you know what, guys, we're going to do this together. And it really was heartening for someone who, you know, like I said, I'm a transit geek. I love transit to find so many people engaged and so many people that actually care about the product that they're putting onto the road, that it will make a better um, environment for our riders and everyone else, but really make kind of a better future for transportation and transit in general. So together, we really have kind of embraced our shared experiences. This group has traveled together a lot uh, around the nation to see what works and sometimes what doesn't. And I just put this, this slide in here. This is not an electric bus on the side, but allegorically, it's kind of like, you know, you can do your best to get to the top of the hill, but you have to make sure you can make it over the top of the hill. So uh, I mean, no disrespect to San Francisco Muni. This was actually on a detour and their bus did get stuck at the top of the hill there. <laughs> But the point is, is together we're going to electrify and you can see our group here, every manufacturer and I think some some of them are on this call right now. Every manufacturer who brought a bus to town, you know, we, we, we put it through its paces, you know, we, we, we saw what it could do and I don't think we had big problems with anything. And that is the best thing for me that electrification of buses electrification of transportation. It's no longer this science project that we talk about, like, oh, you know, I, I'm a little scared about this. Now it's just a matter of us leveraging our purchasing, leveraging our planning, levering, leveraging our construction and infrastructure together to figure out, okay, the technology is ready for us. Now, how do we be ready for the technology? And I think for that, Hiko has been a great partner for us. And you can see our group in here. I know some of the people are on the call. I know Maui's on, Hawaii County's on. You can see we flew out to just demonstrate a BYD electric bus on Maui right there. But you can also see the other the other vehicles that have passed through um, passed through our state and demonstrated levels of success with us. So together we're going to electrify and that's that's what's going to happen.
looking ahead, um, kind of wanted to point out Hawaii Transit Agencies and Hawaii Transit in general has been very successful. Um, there is a competitive grant program called LONO, Low or No Emission Vehicle Competitive Grant Program. And a Hawaii agency has won a, a pretty significant award in 2018, 2019, and 2020. So I think the FTA is looking at us as a demonstration site. Our federal partners are looking at us to be the ones to kind of lead the way. Um, and just on Honolulu's um, horizon right now, it looks like we are in process to look at about 35 electric buses for our future. Um, those are of different sizes and of different funding sources and different quantities. But, you know, that's that's something that's very important for us to start the transition, because if we were to stop buying a diesel bus and not have that operating in by 2035, we keep our buses for 15 years sometimes or more. So that means by now we really should not be buying diesel. So in some ways we have a steep learning curve and a steep construction curve with us, but we're going to try to face it as best as we can. Now, the hitch that COVID-19 may have thrown into this equation for us might actually be somewhat of a benefit because what we found is our, our, our passengers and the public in general nationwide, internationally even, they may not stand for the kind of crowded loads that we used to have in Honolulu or that we have in, in other cities. And even, you know, we have a bus that usually seats 40 now, we can probably seat 20 people on it. So what that's kind of done for us is it's made us really look at, you know, social distancing has influenced the kind of capacity that we can have. And basically, we're going to need to throw more buses and more service out there than we ever have before. So just if you look at this, um, this document, I mean, this picture right here, we used to be able to crowd our buses to, you know, pretty much to the doors. But what we used to carry on one bus now, we may have to carry on three. And why is this important is, uh, you know, transit is an essential service, as we talked about earlier. And we need to keep our workforce moving if we really want to restart and rebuild our economy. And I know from our history here in Honolulu and nationwide that transit flourishes in times of economic recession. And Aki alluded to the transportation being such a high cost. Um, for our family. In fact, the cost of owning one car is probably covers around $9,000 per year. Um, if transit were to pretty much shut down and say, you know what, we can't do this anymore, it's going to have an economic ripple effect. So the question for us is, how do we keep things moving post COVID? And we are going to do our best to invest as much as we can into transit so we can make sure that it is the equitable playing field. It is the, the equity that 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 joins everyone together for economic opportunity to get our our economy moving post COVID. So here we go, um, and I'd like to just shout out to our dedicated transit operators statewide and nationwide for being heroes, moving other heroes. And that's all I have. Thank you so much, John. Those were really. Uh helpful and um, relevant words for everything that we're experiencing right now, collectively today. And I think the, the primary theme that I heard is that we need to collaborate, that we're already collaborating. Uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Michael Colon, manager of electrification of transportation. He and his team, uh, Lisa, have he and Lisa have really done a lot of the heavy lifting around this work and he'll go into the nuts and bolts of our eBus Make Ready program. Thank you very much, Aki, and thank you, John. I uh, really appreciate all the context that you guys are providing for us. Um, transportation is so important. Uh, I myself, growing up, we didn't have a car in my family, so we took the bus uh, everywhere. And so it always has a special place in my heart. Uh, my route currently is the number six. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you. My name is Michael Colon. I'm, um, the manager of electrification and transportation department and Hawaiian Electric. Uh, I've been doing this work for about six years with the company. Uh, you know, and it, we're really excited to be discussing uh, the potential for this uh, electric bus make ready program. Uh, you know, we've been focusing on a lot of details and a lot of high level, um, but you know, sometimes it's the small stuff that also uh, triggers a lot of, you know, positivity and excitement. So the other day I was on a walk with my family and, uh, 
we came up across a bus stop uh, and the bus had, was just about to depart. We all got blasted with a giant blast of uh, diesel exhaust. And I turned, my, I turned to my wife and I said, you know, that's another good thing about electrification is uh, that that experience won't happen in the future. So it's the little stuff, but also the big stuff. And uh, we're pretty excited um, to be sharing the opportunities uh, going, going forward. So uh, this work that we're talking about really started with conversations we had with uh, bus fleet operators in our service territory. We spoke to nine uh, different operators over the last several months, and we really were looking to gain insight and learn from them what um, their key concerns are regarding electrification uh, in general and any questions and ways that um, we could help. So some of the top takeaways that we got were concerns about the cost of the bus, the cost of installing the infrastructure, some of the technical challenges related to that. But then again, as um, kind of Aki had mentioned, uncertainty about the economy, uh, you know, and again, what John has also mentioned, uncertainty about COVID-19, it does change things. And um, they definitely were, were reflecting that to us. Uh, we took that to heart. So our main takeaway from our conversations with these operators were that they want to electrify, uh, but they face many challenges. The first challenge is cost. Uh, operators will need to buy new electric buses as well as that infrastructure to support the charging. Electric buses are generally more expensive upfront than diesel counterparts, even though the bus prices are coming down. However, there are elements and aspects of electric bus ownership that make it potentially cheaper over the long run uh, such as uh, reduced maintenance and operational costs. Uh, but that upfront challenge of costs uh, is really daunting and can be significant. Another challenge is in operations. So bus fleet operators are excellent and experts at what they do. They're able to maximize and draw maximum value out of every drop of gasoline that they have. They've been doing this for years and they know exactly how to do it. Change in technology uh, from electrification would trigger operational changes, uh, changes to routes, changes to maintenance, changes to scheduling. Even the way bus drivers drive the bus may need to be changed. So there's a significant uh, amount of operational planning and reorganization that may happen, may need to happen as a result of uh, converting their fleet. And finally, uh, there are technical challenges, and this really revolves around uh, bus operators re looking at electricity as the fuel for their vehicles. Uh, so that requires some different kind of planning, uh, upfront planning that may, uh, you know, need to be taken into account as they uh, transition their uh, operations. All of these challenges, though, um, you know, we think there's a role for the electric utility uh, as as we transition to, towards a more electrified transportation system, uh, there is significant uh, integration and opportunities to maximize that conversion that we think we want to be proactive and take advantage of uh, as it builds and as the market matures. So the first one, first role that the utility can play is in helping address this infrastructure cost. Uh, by developing and establishing what we're calling this make ready uh, infrastructure program, we can help uh, address some of those upfront infrastructure costs and we'll go into that a little bit more. In addition, uh, we can provide electrical expertise. So Hawaiian Electric, we're in the business of generating and delivering electricity. Uh, and this infrastructure is where we, we have our expertise. Admittedly, this is a slightly different business uh, that we'd be entering into. However, we're uniquely situated as the utility to manage that integration of that new and significant load onto the grid. Um, the additional roles that we uh, could play is help to incentivize the use of renewable energy. So as you know, in this picture here, this is YNI Solar out on the west side. Uh, it's a 30 megawatt solar farm. There are tremendous opportunities to create synergies between uh, the load 
of these electric vehicles, electric buses, and renewable generation. So uh, Aki had mentioned we had uh, set forth a new uh, set of electric bus rates last year, and those rates try to incentivize uh, charging during the day when uh, renewable energy is most abundant and it's cheap, uh, it's cheapest. And this uh, combination of rates and this incentive program really think we really think can help accelerate electric bus adoption. Not just in convincing a bus fleet operator to maybe convert a bus, but also if they're already in in uh, in process of electrifying their fleets, if they have an overall budget and it includes, for example, one bus and a, and the infrastructure. Perhaps by us uh, addressing some of that infrastructure cost, maybe they, instead of buying one bus, can now buy two. So we think it could also potentially broaden the scope of electrification plans in the near term by doing these, uh, the, by doing this program. I mentioned a couple of times this term make ready infrastructure and really what is it? Um, essentially here, this diagram shows both the utility side of uh, the meter and then the customer, what is called here is participant, and then it's separated by the dotted line. Um, the make ready infrastructure as we conceive the program will constitute everything you see here on the utility side, as well as on the participant side up to the charge station. So this would be the utility designing and constructing and installing all of that infrastructure up to a junction box. And then the charge station would be uh, the responsibility of the customer participant to procure and install, um, choose, procure, and install on their own. So, but this cost of this upgrade and the extensions and the panel upgrades are, could be significant and it could really help uh, reduce the barriers to adoption. Um, so this is a high level uh, overview of what we're looking for this pilot phase. So. We're envisioning a two part uh, program. This initial pilot phase is what we're talking about today. Uh, and we anticipate it taking a, uh, a matter of a few years. And then post pilot, then we would be looking to expand this program into a formal uh, program with expanded uh, application. So uh, the program would be looking to provide make ready infrastructure for electric bus charging for up to 20 charging stations at up to between five to 10 customer sites uh, and really, you know, working with uh, customers on a case by case basis to evaluate their needs and uh, figure out where the best uh, location would be to site these, uh, site the infrastructure and maximize the value and minimize the overall cost of the program, uh, cost of the project itself. And we, for the customers, when we engage with them, uh, we realize that this is new. Uh, this is new. This is a new area for them and new uh, new experience. And so we envision kind of a multi-step process to kind of walk our customers through what we're calling the customer journey, uh, which begins from the application phase and all ends in implementation and utilization. So you know we envision this journey, and this is all just still kind of a draft concept, but uh, you know, a customer who's interested would apply with us. We would uh, visit the site, do our initial assessments. Uh, if we agree to the conditions, then we would uh, reserve some funding and then go through a pre construction uh, review where, you know, the customer would provide uh, proof of a charger procurement. And at that point, then we really begin. We, we engage with our construction contractor. And we would design and build all the make ready infrastructure for the customer at their site at the utilities expense. Uh, once we once we've completed that construction, then the customer would buy their charge station and install it. And then we would come out again and verify and energize. And then we would switch over from this kind of uh, you know, construction phase into implementation phase where the customer goes ahead and just uses their charge stations and we collect data and report on it. That customer journey um, is going to be 
significant in, in developing the data and key takeaways that we're looking to learn in this pilot phase so that we are successful as we ramp up. It is new. Um, it is a new business area for us. And so because of that, we want to take this pilot phase to make sure that we learn what we can, uh, try our test out our assumptions and make sure that we're doing this in an appropriate manner so that when we go and expand it, we're kind of a well oiled machine and we've learned a lot and we've made the requisite adjustments uh, that need to be made um, so that it's a pretty efficient program moving forward. So up here right now I have what's called key learning objectives. These are essentially what we're looking to learn from our engagement in the pilot process. And you know, some of the things we wanna understand are like for the, for example, the cost of make ready infrastructure. We have examples from the mainland of other utilities who have uh, deployed the infrastructure. We have local examples of the cost, uh, but there's still assumptions and we wanna make sure when we do it, you know, are our assumptions correct? Is it that expensive or is it less or more? Uh, similarly, we'd be looking to understand, you know, how effective were we in deploying the number of chargers uh, and how many buses were served uh, per customer, per project, as well as, you know, can we improve uh, pilot cycle time through the application design and construction phase and then customer satisfaction. All of these things will be key inputs into how we evaluate and look to improve upon uh, the program moving forward. This, uh, this slide is also important right now with you folks too, because what we have here is a preliminary list and we have more ideas that we have that we're putting together, but we wanna understand from you folks what is most important to you? Um, if you see the utility doing this program, what would you like us, what would you like to see as a takeaway uh, to learn whether or not this program was effective for you? So uh, this is a great opportunity to provide feedback either now or afterwards uh, from you folks. We'd love to hear, you know, are there different ways to measure, or evaluate, or think about the program and implementation that we can improve upon? Uh, at you know post pilot phase and stretching out into a more um, robust program. The other thing we're thinking of too is that you know we go through this pilot phase and we're focused on electric bus, but perhaps at the end of the pilot phase, um, different customer segments are now market ready in the heavy duty space. Maybe we could expand the type of customer segment as well. Um, so some of those things, you know, this kind of learning um, and the deployment of the actual infrastructure will be key to help us kind of meet the needs uh, that as we see markets maturing and they definitely are maturing. So um, those are, this is an important slide and an important uh, concept that we're gonna be you know, developing, but also would love to hear community engagement, key stakeholder engagement as to what's really important for us. So, this is our draft pilot uh, phase timeline. So this is kind of how we see this coming together over the next uh, several years. So what we anticipate filing this application at the end of this month, and there's a regulatory review period, which um, isn't defined. It's, it depends on the commission's uh, workload and everything else. So. The assumption is not set in stone here, it's just an assumption. But if we were to assume approval in February of 2021, after we receive approval in our application, we'd be asking for post-approval uh, design phase of eight months, wherein we put, uh, we put together the remaining elements of the pilot program that we wanted to establish once we got approval for. So, you know, uh, executing contracts, uh, issuing RFIs for uh, construction, contracting, putting together some of the uh, program participation agreement aspects, setting up our website to handle applications, some of these things that, uh, you know, require cost and labor input, and we want to make sure we get the approval first, but the, we'll need to ramp up. So that eight month, eight month period is crucial for us uh, before we go live with the program, which uh, we anticipated late 2021 um, or early 2022. 
And then the next phase is that 16 months, which is the pilot implementation phase. And that's really where we're meeting with customers, going through that customer journey that I uh, mentioned previously, uh, designing and implementing the infrastructure and um, putting it in the ground. Uh, once that 16 month period, we, we hope to have expended our full uh, budgetary cap and uh, then we transition into data collection uh, where we're just uh, collecting data and uh, evaluating the effectiveness of the program. And then at the end of that period, that's where we would be looking to um, expand the program, submit a request to expand the program, reflect on our learnings, make our modifications, make our recommended modifications, and then um, request again with the commission to expand the uh, program um, out of the pilot phase. So that's a lot of information. Um, and thank you very much for your time and attention. I know there's a, I hope this is helpful for everyone. I know there's probably been, probably going to be a lot of questions. Uh, so we're able to uh, have some time here to discuss uh, any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. So now we're going to um, move into the Q&A <laughs> section of the uh, program. And uh, if you have, I think several of you have already sent questions over to Lisa, and she's going to um, go through them and read them out. Okay, there was just one question for John. Um, they said, great presentation and very inspiring, but they were wondering, um, with the COVID issues, how long do you envision them lasting? And then with Hawaii's curve, not only flattened, but crushed, do you see that these protections as being mooted over the long term? That's actually a really good question. And, and I, I wish I had a better answer than what I'm gonna give right now, but we really are following things as they happen right now and trying to anticipate anything. I mean, we're trying to just look at August right now. Um, my feeling is, is that if we have any hope for um, economic recovery, there are so many things that have to happen in order for us to just get this this massive wheel moving. And I think one of those things is that you know kids probably are going to end up going back to school. And I just have to shout out to Lauren and the issue she's having with her cat over there because I think it's adorable. But <laughs> anyway, um, we're we're really looking forward maybe at August and December as our time points working towards December, we're looking at restoring the majority of our service. And in fact, quite possibly um, really shifting our focus to do our core services on our routes that have the busiest ridership and really readjusting our service levels island wide to just to, to take a, a wholesale look at where we need to provide service. But in terms of the protections for the operators and our passengers, I don't think that that's something that we're going to give up on or that we're going to eclipse. I think everybody's expectation of their new normal is as clean as can be, as safe as can be. And I don't think anybody is going to penny pinch in that effort to provide the safest environment for everyone. Thank you, John. Um, you know, I, I wanted to have uh, June wanted to mention that she has a really good uh, program she's going to share about her electric bus assistance program. So, um, June, why don't you go ahead and um, mention that to the group? Yeah, thanks so much, Lisa. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is June Chi. Um, I'm with the Hawaii State Energy Office. And just want to thank Michael for sharing um, about the, the Make Ready program. I think it complements our pilot program that we're going to launch in June or July of this year as well. We're using um, Volkswagen settlement funds as well as um, DIRA funds from the Department of Health to help fleet owners replace electric buses and then um, install charging stations as well. So we're kind of doing the more customer side and you guys are definitely supporting um, with all the infrastructure underneath. So I think it's a really awesome compliment and we're doing our first round of it this summer as well. So hopefully there's a lot of lessons learned we can share from that. Um, our data collection, we will be doing a lot of um, data on kind of the emissions, uh, diesel emissions that are reduced because of our funding sources. So we definitely want to encourage you guys to continue to include that. 
And um, also we're focusing specifically on electric buses right now, but letting it be tour buses, school buses, or transit buses. So curious to see if you guys are doing the same. Um, and if you do plan to maybe expand that to other medium and heavy duty vehicles as well in the future. So just wanted to make a little plug for that. If there are any fleet operators on the line as well, um, I will definitely make sure to get this information out so you guys can apply for the program. Thank you, June. Okay. Um, Michael, do you want to touch on kind of plans for uh, commercial make ready and what just a little preview of what folks can look forward to? Sure. Um, yeah, I wanted to, you know, try and focus on eBus, but we we are also planning. We had, all right, let me back up. We last year we had filed a work plan with the commission with our near term plans uh, for our electrification. And it consisted of three filings. Uh, one is the eBus make ready, which we're talking about today. Uh, the other one is the development of two new rates for electric vehicles. One is gonna be a high capacity rate, and then the other one is a commercial rate. Uh, and the final filing is the commercial make ready. So very similar in concept to what we talked about here, but focus more on for light duty vehicle charging infrastructure targeted at multiple unit dwellings, so condos, townhomes, apartment buildings, as well as uh, commercial locations and then workplace charging and also fleets. So there are other opportunities that we're working on to kind of you know round out the uh, the program development. And so it will look similar, but um, probably be broader in scope um, for that because there's more of that type of customer out there. Um, but we anticipate filing that towards the end of this year. Uh, and before that, the rates that I discussed uh, we'll be looking towards the end of the summer to submit um, those two rates with the commission. So we have a lot of things in flight, uh, a lot of things in flux, but it's all trying to push us to that next phase of implementation of infrastructure and supporting it through rates uh, as we evaluate rates and how they interact with the grid and what kind of incentive structure we want to develop. Hey, Michael, um, can you hear me? This is Tom with Greenlots. Hey, Tom. Hey, um, sorry, I, I sent a note to Lisa, but I, I thought maybe I'd just ask you the question directly. Um, in regard to the, the eBus uh, pilot, um, you know, as you know, uh, load management is, is a particular priority for green lots. And just curious kind of how you're thinking about um, leveraging the pilot for identifying uh, load management opportunities. Well, that's a really good question. And our preliminary focus has been on, you know, it's it's a it's a combination of two things, right? Uh, bus fleet operators have uh, routes and they have schedules, so we wanted to be able to be enable the flexibility as much as possible. Um, but we also want to encourage utilization of renewables, so we're looking to pair our e-bus rate with the make ready program. So heavily incentivizing renewable use during the day. Uh, as far as any other additional load management on site batteries, um, that's really up to the customer right now in, in how they wanna manage. We're certainly flexible and see the value in looking and exploring new ways to address uh, load impacts. On our side, um, we're still in development for our grid, uh, our aggregated demand response program. And so once those values are clearly established across, you know, the full array of grid services, we go out and start issuing RFPs to uh, aggregate the demand response services. Uh, then I think the opportunity will be between the customer and the demand response aggregator to figure out with their operational profile where those load management opportunities exist. So, um, you know, it's, we are welcome to it. We're excited about it, but there is still kind of a process for some of those grid services and then um, the customer uh, demand load, load impact mitigation, I think is still 
we want to be able to be flexible with, but also not put for the customer. You know, likewise, if I can ask a question um, of both John and Michael. Um, first of all, great presentations, really inspiring, great to hear this information coming out. Happy to hear that Pico is going to be submitting applications for make readies. And um, as an FYI, I've worked for 15 years on utility policy in California and have been active in the EV rate making policies uh, in California for a decade now. And of course, California is doing similar things. And great to see that Hawaii is um, looking to emulate those successful models from California. My question for you, particularly Michael, is in terms of costs for EV buses still being quite a bit higher than alternatives or more traditional buses, have you considered the impact on lifetime costs of owning the solar facility? And so in addition to make readies, if a fleet operator <clears throat> owns um, the solar at the facility, um, our analysis is that the cost uh, of the life will be substantially lower. Um, have you looked at that kind of um, analysis in your um, application and more general kind of policy discussion? Sorry, and correctly, did you say owning the bus itself, the uh, battery facility? Or yeah, right. I'm asking him, have you looked at the um, the impact of EV bus ownership for fleets in terms of owning also a solar system on site for charging? And so that can generally, of course, lower charging costs pretty dramatically. Um, so in terms of having make ready um, as a cost savings measure for fleet operators, have you yeah. also looked at the impact of on site? Um, owned or leased solar for a cost for EV bus ownership? That's a great question. Uh, I think we, to be upfront, we have not looked at that, and I think we made a series of conscious decisions. Uh, we're trying to leverage the utility scale renewables first and foremost, uh, but also on site, I think there's limited um, space available. So some of those on site solar facilities may be more appropriate where there's larger bus depots. You might see that more on the mainland. We have um, very limited land space. Uh, even in, in some of these bus locations, there aren't significant areas where we could put some solar. So I think it's it's definitely a good idea and I don't want to close the door to it. Uh, that's the purpose of this pilot is to figure out other ways to kind of address and minimize costs. And so I definitely open to it. You know, I, I think upfront costs are our concern for uh, our customers, but you know, right now we've been focused on the cost for the infrastructure, uh, the charging infrastructure. Um, but if there are opportunities, we're certainly open to uh, having those discussions. Great, thank you. Okay, there were. Sorry, one more question, if you don't mind. Uh, there were a few questions for um, John, I believe, as kind of follow up for the, the transit side. Uh, and I guess one of them was with reactions to COVID and on-demand services, et cetera. Um, is there room to introduce smaller cutaway electric vehicles? And then also, I guess, a question on what is the current um, fleet size of all the buses in Honolulu and Hawaii, if you know? Ooh, that's a trivia question that I think I should know, but I don't. Um, well, I know our fleet, we have 544 transit buses and we have about 188 paratransit vehicles that we use for handy van service. So um, to answer the first question, yes, I think there is room in our fleet for electrification of, of smaller vehicles and the adoption of smaller vehicles. Um, that section of the market has not developed um, as in a, in a mature way as the, the heavy duty transit bus has so far. However, you know, we do see some promise in, um, wow, the last time I traveled was back in February, which seems like a really long time ago now, but um, at, at that, at the conference I did go to, I did have the opportunity to see a lot of um, smaller electric vehicles that could be used for, for you know, demand responsive service. Um, that is, you know, they, a lot of them do come from Europe um, and are of European design, so they would, they would need to pass uh, federal book uh, United States federal motor vehicle safety standards 
But um, as we see that nascent part of the, the vehicle market develop, yes, definitely, we'd like to look at electrifying smaller vehicles. Thank you, John. I don't think anything, I don't think I missed any other ones for John. Um, getting to uh, Michael, there was one question, and I think I can clarify that. It was asking about whether Hawaiian Electric would own the charges. And if you go back to, you know, Michael did have a slide showing what we were considering and defining make ready to be, as it was the infrastructure up until the charger. So the customer, participant, whether it's the bus or fleet, you know, when if we, for the other pilot, that would be the responsibility of the customer. So we would not own the chargers under this proposal that we're gonna pilot. Um, let's see, there was a bunch of questions. Um, there was also another question regarding um, what the process would be as far as to apply and participate in the program. Um, you know, that was that customer journey um, slide that Michael just showed, and we're still developing how we're going to um, do the application process. We're thinking that um, for this pilot for the bus, you know, being that there aren't hundreds of, of possible participants for applications that we probably won't have like a portal, you know, a website or a portal, it probably could be more as a conversation and an application form and meeting, you know, with, with them. But we're still trying to get to the details of, of that and we'll work on that as we continue developing the process. Yeah, and just to dovetail off what Lisa said, you know, um, that this is, you know, it's a, we are looking to develop and be efficient in the way we uh, design the program. So we understand that, um, you know, we could set up a, robust website and application portal but if there's you know we we reached out to a, a lot of and most of the um, bus fleet operators uh, in our service territory so we we already kind of know the the universe and the number that we derive for the number of charge stations that we're looking to deploy is based on those conversations right now there's very limited number of electric vehicles with uh, installed charge stations in our service ter territory, very few. Uh, it's a handful at the most. So really, you know, going from, from that to 20 would be pretty significant, um, but, you know, we, we are looking to expand in the long run. And so uh, taking the measured approach with our capital expense, but also in developing the IT and background software and everything, will need to come, especially as we start transitioning into the commercial make ready, where I think there's going to be more uh, individual applications. So we leverage so that we avoid kind of the backlog issues that some other programs have had in the past. Um, but we are trying to be measured in our approach as we develop and implement. Okay. Uh, let's see. There was a whole bunch that came in all at once. So let me make sure I didn't miss where it Okay, so there was a question on whether there will be a cost benefit analysis or for con consumers done and what that would look like. And then also if the, if the rollout will go to the neighbor islands and I can add to that, yes, it, it, it was going to be for, it's not just a Honolulu pilot. Um, but so as far as the cost benefit um, analysis, I don't know if Michael, you want to just answer that one sure yeah so there will be a cost benefit analysis done uh, we will be looking to establish uh, the impacts on um, other rate payers other rate classes uh, from the uh, budgetary requests that we're asking um, so anticipate taking an assumption of the load that these bus bus um, operators will create and translate it into a revenue assumption and then project it out over period. There's questions on whether we are considering wireless charging for the buses. And so I'm not sure if that's something maybe John could sort of touch on, on is that something that they looked at in their... We have looked at other properties that are doing wireless charging and 
Um, I, I think we are going in a direction where we, when we do do what's called opportunity charging, we're going to be using an overhead pantograph on, on our buses. I think the amount of power loss when you do the induction charging through the concrete, um, I, I think we would rather spend money on the infrastructure to have to maximize the amount of charge we can get in a short period of time. We have looked at other places that are doing that, such as um, Los Angeles. Um, they have a bus rapid transit way um, that they're looking at in induction in that kind of charging, wireless charging. And also in Northern California, um, one of the agencies up there did a pilot with that type of charging. But I think our, our direction right now is going to be to go to uh, a direct uh, charging via overhead pantograph. I'm not sure. I, I just got a chat from Keith. I'm not sure who Keith is, but he said he proposed questions directly to John and Michael. But um, I'm not sure we had it set up so that the, the chats could just come directly either to me. Um, I'm not sure if they, they may not have received it. So um, if Keith could either resend it to me. And there was a question on uh, how much will building the make ready infrastructure cost. And, and I think Michael can sort of touch on that high level um, amount that we were gonna be considering for the pilot. Yeah, and so, um, you know, he consciously didn't really include it in the presentation just because I think it's hard to gauge context for the costs. Um, yeah, but we did draw from um, consultants engagement. We've, we've reached out to other utilities and got some of their costs. We compared it to some of the work that's done here um, and local construction costs to try and come up with kind of a ballpark of what we think would um, encompass this pilot phase cost in addition to, you know, administrative costs um, for setting up a program and kind of expanding the operational profile of the EOT department uh, and Hawaiian Electric as well. So um, the over, overall budgetary uh, request with the commission will be slightly under $4 million for the pilot phase, and that will include all the infrastructure costs as well. Okay, um, I have a question and I'm not sure if John would be able to share any um, information, but um, some people had asked whether, what is the cost of electric buses? Sure, um, it really depends on how we spec it out. And I, I know that's kind of a vague answer, but um, right now we are seeing the, the costs the, the gap between buying a clean diesel bus and an electric bus, we're seeing that gap narrow a little bit, but it really, uh, so does anybody want to take a guess? Um, I guess it's going to be hard here. Uh, our average bus right now costs about, maybe about 450 to $500,000. That's for a diesel bus, a regular standard 40 foot diesel bus. Um, we, we would probably see, depending on how, many, how much battery capacity we put on, an electric bus would probably raise that price about anywhere from uh, 150 to 200,000 to 250,000 uh, dollars as a premium. So to that end, that's why we've been using a lot of the, the federal funding to cover that cost gap between purchasing a diesel bus versus uh, an electric bus. We've been using that, applying our, our regular monies to buy what we would consider a standard diesel bus and then having um, the federal government pay for the difference the difference in terms of batteries but it really does depend our buses come in about four sizes and as we look at electrification if we want to throw the bus out there all day we'll throw as much batteries as we can on the bus but if we're looking at the type of opportunity charge model where the bus will come into the, the terminus and then park there and then suck up as much electricity as it can during that break then we'll probably be less we're probably more likely to put less batteries on the bus just because we're carrying around less weight and the economies of scale for efficiency would be would be different in that uh, in that sense. Oh, do we know um, how many uh, electric bus chargers there are in Hawaii now and who owns them? I think John can probably speak to Honolulu. Yeah, currently we actually only have one right now and that's at our Kalihi Palama bus facility. But also there, we're looking at increasing that to 12. So uh, by the end of year, 
So we will have a lot more capacity. And what we what we believe we can pull off in the early stages of electrification is a one to three, uh, one charger to three bus ratio. So that should be able to help us out a lot um, in terms of the 35 vehicles that we're looking at getting in the upcoming in our, in our procurement um, plans. Um, to that end, I know that um, JTB also has chargers and so does Enoa. So I, I don't know if they're on the line and maybe you can speak to that, but um, I, I do know that there's probably more private chargers than there are public chargers for buses right now. There is another question and I wasn't sure who it was to, but I just got another follow-up. So is there room or opportunities for a P3 where you can change CapEx to OpEx over an extended period of time? Uh, in essence, purchasing buses upfront to leverage efficiencies and meet goals. I, I think they were saying that if, uh, if John could, could answer that. I think there's always room for creative financing opportunities, especially, you know, if you look at, um, I know even with HECO, we've discussed the potential of HECO owning the batteries and we purchased the buses and that would, you know, I know we've just started to talk about that. So yes, we're open to any kind of creative uh, capital um, or operating um, type of investments that would result in a cleaner fleet for us. I think that mainly covers the questions. We did have um, comments on the learning objectives that we might consider is consumer satisfaction feedback, actual air quality impact, and maintenance considerations. And I think, you know, those are good considerations and in our pilot we were going to have key you know key performance metrics to identify and you know the objectives that we want to um, get out of the pilot so so thank you for that input again thanks for this information it's really helpful um, we're on the big island um, working with the county to try and get the county to buy some EV buses and of course cost is a you know quick response as to why it's difficult so it's great to hear that I'm way on that and buying a bunch of buses. Hopefully that will be you know, a, a watershed event for other agencies to follow. My question though for, um, for Michael is even with the make ready installation, do you um, have any rough figures you can share as to the customer cost for the rest of the build out in terms of the charger and related equipment? beyond the make ready. So what are the average costs to the customer, the fleet operator for installing an EV bus charging station? You know, um, it's a little different than, I mean, it's starting to standardize, um, but I don't have anything offhand I can share, but, um, you know, I can follow up with you on that. Um, our, our data, you know, is drawing from other areas, other utilities, and then locally, as I mentioned, very few deployments. Um, so that's an, is, that's an issue, but also it varies from site to site, right? So every project is different in terms of the actual um, infrastructure cost. And then, you know, the charger itself, whether it's uh, how it's actually placed also can implicate costs. Uh, but yeah, I can, I can follow up with you on that. That'd be great. Thanks again. I know as far as um, getting back, I don't know if you know and the and JTB are on the WebEx to answer about how many chargers they have, but that's something that we did have some outreach with them and we'll go back and take a look at you know what information they provided and are willing to share and see if we can get that information out. All right, thank you so much for the lively discussion. We we have one last mentee for you guys before we close out. And this is really to help us kind of understand better, um, you know, we're just one sliver of the puzzle of really deploying this bus infrastructure. So we really wanna get a sense of the, the entire world, at least from your perspective. Um, so if you can log back onto Menti and answer the question that's on there. Um, Lisa will then share her screen again. So again, the um, number is seven six eight seven eight one. Yeah, with, with respect to the uh, recommendation of extending the e-bus rates, that's definitely in our plans. Um, we want to make sure that it's ready and available for the for the program uh, 
assuming it gets approved. Okay, well, while, while you folks are considering to pop, uh, continuing to populate this, I'll just close out with some next steps. So, again, thank you so much for joining us this morning and for all of your great thought partnership. We're going to absolutely reach out to you <laughs> very shortly. Uh, we have um, a follow up email we'll, where we'll include some of the great information that John shared today and some of um, the follow up answers that maybe we weren't able to answer as well. Um, and we're planning, just so you understand our timeline, we're actually planning on filing this proposal on June 30th. So there'll be more information kind of moving forward. Um, and for those who got the email blast from emob at hawaiianelectric.com, our next stakeholder meeting or our next Drive Electric Dialogue is going to be focused on the Critical Backbone tool, which is a tool that we developed uh, a few, I think a year or so ago, and we wanna make it a little bit more widely available and, and share kind of its functionality with the community at large. And so please tune in for that, mark your calendars, July 29th, uh, same time, same place, I think. <laughs> And um, we're really looking forward to continuing to connect with you and uh, continuing the dialogue. So uh, it's great, great to connect with everyone. Thank you.